Hi everybody, welcome to another video. Thanks for tuning in. For those that know me, hello. For those that don't know me, hello. We talk about all things holistic health and wellness related on this channel. That includes things like digestive issues, painful periods, fertility, skin, rashes, all different types of things, infections, viruses. And today's topic is one that is still a little unknown. There's a lot that we still have to learn about this. But as per usual, you guys know I like to share with you things and uh, that are happening in clinical practice, I should say. And the theme has been chronic fatigue, brain fog. So many people are just saying, I don't feel great. And this is actually after C19. And so we all know that we've been living in crazy times with C19. I'm gonna call it that because I don't know what is being filtered and whatnot. And you know, this is important for you guys to know all the things, right? So we'll refer to it as C19. Well, everyone at some point at this point in life has been exposed to a virus. That's just the way viruses work. It's not a matter of, I hope I don't get this thing. It's a matter of when I get this thing, how am I gonna navigate it? So the topic that we're gonna be discussing today is somebody that is or has been infected with C19 and is having long symptoms associated with it or long C19 symptoms. A lot of people are, are familiar with this in terms of like PACS, post-acute C19 syndrome is kind of the terminology or even long C19 is what they're calling it. And really it's people that have a multitude of things. So for example, you could say I didn't have a lot of symptoms originally when I was exposed to C19, or you could say I did have a ton of symptoms. I was really, really tired. I had myalgia. I had arthralgia, joint pain, body pain, muscle pain. I had the fever. I, I, I was sleeping often. I had the brain fog. Regardless of how, how, it present, how it presented to you in terms of the symptoms, with the original C19 infection, it doesn't matter. The research is showing it doesn't matter. What is happening for a lot of people is a positive ABV reactivation because of the inflammation that C19 induced. So what I'm here to share with you is that if you had long C19, you actually likely didn't have long C19. What you had was a, an original C19 infection that caused Epstein-Barr virus to reactivate and amplify. And that was what created the long COVID symptoms. The research is showing, and I'm gonna link for you guys a bunch of stuff here because this is kind of newer stuff that's being shown to us through PubMed and uh, NIH. But the research is showing that the nature of C19 isn't to create chronic fatigue syndrome. The nature of it isn't to create um, brain fog, right? The nature of the, the life cycle of that virus isn't this long sequelae. However, what appears to be the mechanism of action of why someone was having such a difficult time after the original infection is because of another virus, which you guys know, ABV, Epstein-Barr virus. Now, the reason that I'm talking about this is A, because I'm seeing a boatload of autoimmune conditions that are cropping up in blood work panels. And I'm also having a lot of people clinically tell me they are just not the same since having this infection. And so we're blaming it on C19 when the actual culprit behind this is C19 inducing Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. So that's what's going on. What, what they're finding is the mechanism of this kind of drawn out, waxing and waning. It's been months. I'm still not feeling good. Some people are still sharing with me months or years later that they have sore throats that they're waking up with that seem random. They're like, I still sometimes feel that nasal congestion. I still feel stuffed, stuffed up and the brain fog. Now, when this happened, I remember a lot of my patients sharing with me the brain fog, the brain fog, the brain fog, the lack of focus. The, like the forgetfulness, the clarity. A lot, of, a lot of men don't necessarily lead with that symptom. Not that they don't get that right, because that's not a fair thing to say, but men often aren't the ones to get brain fog as frequent as women. It's kind of like Hashimoto's or thyroid stress. We don't see thyroid stress in males as often as we do in females. Of course we see it. And one of the things that was interesting was that a lot of my male patients were sharing with me something that they couldn't describe but they were trying to describe brain fog. They're like, I don't know what this is. I can't read emails for work. I, I feel like I'm not fully in my body. I feel like I'm just not fully present. I am forgetting things. I'm not sharp. Uh, I feel frustrated with myself at trying to recall words or things that I'm trying to say or ideas. And I said, you have brain fog. And they're like, what is brain fog? And it's, 
It's, it's not a real medical term, right? Brain fog is not a real medical term, although it should be. It basically is a term that includes kind of cognitive disorientation or cognitive impairment and, and how we're processing in our brain, how quickly we're able to process, right? It's almost like imagine reading something and you're like, got it, understood it, totally understand what's going on. And, and then you have something else that someone shares with you and you're like, I, can you say that again? I didn't, really, I didn't really catch that the first time. That's what, that's what brain fog is. It's like a lowering of the threshold neurologically of how quickly we're able to respond or think of things. So that is one of the things that is not so talked about. And you guys know that I'm a big, a big advocate of Epstein-Barr virus awareness and really the amount of damage it does and more and more research is coming out about it turning on lymphocytic cancers. It's a lymphoproliferative ailment. Now, I wanna make a couple things clear because maybe this is your first time watching this video and maybe you're like, I've never come to your channel before. I didn't know you talked about Epstein-Barr virus in depth. But let's take a step back for a second because EBV is a human gamma herpes virus. We all get it. It's, it's really super, super common. However, just like with T19, the way in which our bodies handle the infections can be completely different. And some people, when they're younger, usually we get this when we're like, I would say like 17 to 22, 23 years old is when we're first exposed to the lytic phase or the first introduction of EBV. That's the age it looks just like strep throat. It looks just like white patches in the throat. Maybe you get a culture or a swab and your doctor says, nope, go home, you don't have strep throat. You likely have EBV. What's the cure? There is no cure, it's a virus. However, I do really wanna reiterate this because I've been inundated with questions from people on Instagram because they saw this new article that was talking about this. I, get the, I guess this um, topic is going around viral on Instagram that people are like, oh my gosh, like it's not actually C19, it's EBV. So I got a lot of messages from people and they're like, but what do I do with this then? So is there no cure for this? How do I navigate this? And my response is no, there is a lot of supportive things that you can do to help the immune system. There are antiviral tinctures, there's antiviral homeopathic remedies. There's an entire line. There's actually people that have created specific formulas for Epstein-Barr virus. It's almost like the way to think about it is you need a key to open the door. General antivirals, while they may help, like for example, monolaurin leaf, olive leaf extract, uh, lauracid and monolaurin L lysine. These are all some of the classic antivirals that do work on a lot of other herpes viruses, which EBV is in the herpes family. However, Epstein Barr seems to have a more specific key it needs to open the door. So there are tinctures and remedies and botanical medicine treatments and herbal remedies that can support lowering viral load. You're never going to get rid of a virus, it's always in us. But the way that we think about it is, are we in a reactivated place with it? Are we in a place where the virus is, is alive and creating damage inside the tissues? Now you guys may or may not know this, but Epstein-Barr virus is the virus that causes Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Epstein-Barr virus is the virus that causes lymphomas, certain lymphomas, B-cell lymphomas. It's also been linked to MS, multiple sclerosis. So it turns on the immune system and in certain people, it changes the immune modulation where their immune system starts to flag things as problematic and not flag things that should be flagged as not problematic. It gets a little bit confused. And so the nature of this is that the, the classic symptoms are chronic fatigue syndrome. This virus is known, Epstein-Barr virus in the 80s used to be known as chronic fatigue syndrome virus. That's what its claim to fame was. Joint pains, arthralgias, myalgias, body pain, neck pain, uh, migratory joint pain. It looks just like any other stealth infection. It looks like Lyme disease. It looks like a lot of these kind of stealth things that may be happening behind the scenes. So I wanted to just come on to share with you guys a few things that if you are dealing with or have dealt with or are still saying, I am not the same ever since C19, likely what you need to do is get a blood profile to take a look at your Epstein-Barr viral titer. So it is a blood work profile. We can look at the early antigen. We can look at the viral capsid antigen. Um, there's an EAD, there's, there's a couple cells that we can look at, um, a VCA, there's specific cells that are involved with, is it possible or can I identify if I've reactivated Epstein-Barr virus in the blood work? This is a blood panel that we would be able to order. 
So probably my suggestion for you is if you're saying, I'm not the same, I'm still just as tired, all of a sudden I've developed thyroid stress. That's a very real thing. I'm seeing that in practice. I'm seeing patients that never had thyroid stress before, all of a sudden turn on their autoimmunity, their ANA, and also turn on um, thyroid issues namely Hashimoto. So they're like, I've never been told this before. I've never had this tested before, or I've had this tested before and I was always negative. The nature of viruses is they create stress to organs. C19 was a lot more respiratory. We saw a lot of lung respiration, um, sinus congestion. EBV is not that same. It's more throat. It lives in this region and it creates lymphocytic infiltration which means there's lymphocytes, which are cells that are involved with the immune system. So we get, we get swollen glands with EBV and it creates maybe some difficulty swallowing, some achiness in the neck. Sometimes it creates um, just tension, right? Like it's just like my neck is feeling just really, really tight and I just feel achy and it creates thyroid stress. The thyroid lives here. So I would say that if there was a presentation, EBV likes to live here. That is something that needs to be addressed. So the point of the story of this video is really just to talk about A, what's happening clinically, and also, if this is applicable to you, just know that there's options to support you, and you're going to have to embark on some antiviral immune work. The, the protocol for this type of infection is diving down to the immune system, which really addresses everything. We're gonna take a look at your digestive system as your gut is your immune system. And if you're saying, ah, I'm starting to see the connection here. I do have, I had C19 and then I had really, really a difficult time with it, kind of the sequelae, the aftermath of it. And I'm still dealing with lingering symptoms of fatigue and body pain and brain fog and low energy and joint pain. That's where we'd start to say, we need to test you and look at what else is happening because really the, the, if you take away anything from this, the point of the story is that a viral infection will cause other viral infections to come out to play. Viruses love to play together. So if you have one thing, you likely have another thing. And so that is just really the point of today's story. So you're actually likely not dealing with C19, you're dealing with EBV. As per usual, guys, if you have questions or wanna learn more about this, share this video with someone, send this to them. Be sure to subscribe to my channel, Dr. Elise Tarsi. I'm gonna link everything down below and um, we can keep the conversation going. The next video that I'm gonna be sharing with you guys too is regarding C19 and women's health, women's menstrual cycles, clotting, pelvic pain, and infertility because C19 gets into the ACE receptor of the ovary and changes the reception of the hormones. So that is gonna be another topic. I think we're gonna make a little kind of life after C19 series here to support you guys because a lot of people are coming in and they're not realizing that, wait a second, I didn't even think that that had anything to do with my current symptoms, right? Like, how's your period? Tell me about menstruation. Tell me about, have you been trying to get pregnant? Tell me about your hormones. And women are, because there's not a lot of knowledge, right, about this stuff, they're like, oh, I didn't even think that having C19 had anything to do with the current place of my health. And as we go through life, more and more and more, we're gonna get more research, right? There's gonna be more knowledge about the, the aftermath of this virus, the aftermath of this virus, because as much as our con concern at the time was, will I survive, right? That was everybody's kind of thought is, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? Yes, you will survive. And we also need to address the long-term investments that are gonna be happening that are affecting the tissues. So thanks guys for tuning in as always and be sure to like this video, give it a thumbs up if you like this stuff and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you guys in the next video.